So, uh, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to today's thematic forum on security, organized by the European Left Party in the frame of the European Forum. Uh, my name is Katerina Anastasiu, and I'm a facilitator for Transform Europe, the political foundation associated with the left in the European Parliament. Uh, my colleague Axel Rupert from the Brussels office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and I were asked to moderate uh, today's thematic session uh, of the European Forum on security. The past four years, the European Forum has established itself as a space of dialogue among progressive political forces, and we look forward to having this important exchange on security today. Axel and I will now give you a brief introduction uh, to our discussion and guide you through the rest uh, of our event. Uh, concluding, Maite Mola, the Vice President of the EL, uh, will summarize our today's discussion and she will be also reporting in the final session of the forum on the 28th of November. So trying to lay some stones uh, for our discussion today, um, the COVID pandemic and the emergencies that are caused by it highlight the, the need for a concept of security that actually uh, caters for the security needs of everyday life. And this is a contrast uh, to the uh, current um, security concepts that are focusing on military spending and military action, on policing, oppression and surveillance. Predominantly, uh, security politics of our times derive from a Cold War logic. They focus on military reaction to threats. They neglect environmental degradation, large-scale environmental or infrastructure disasters, pandemics, uh, food security, social security, and so on. Yet, the term security dictates much of today's policies and politics and is hegemonized by the right. To name some examples, uh, the European Union is about to subsidize arms projects with money from the EU budget in its long-term uh, budget proposal. Uh, this being one of the most obvious results of the ongoing militarization of the European Union uh, in which member states shift resources and money to military endeavors and away from social and peaceful priorities. The establishment and ongoing militarization of Fortress Europe at the European borders uh, was erected uh, to prevent people fleeing war, violence and the results of extractivist capitalism from reaching the source of Europe to seek refuge. Yet, um, it does nothing to solve the situations which force these people to flee. On the contrary, Fortress Europe puts in question the very basic human rights of all of us and this happens also in the name uh, of security. I would now pass uh, to Axel that will also say a couple of words and help us kick off then the debate. Axel, please. Thank you, Katerina. As Katerina introduced, I'm Axel Rupert from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's Brussels office and I'll be moderating tonight together with Katerina. And continuing the, the list of examples that we see, um, for the failure of current security policies is, or another example, is the development of new gas infrastructure in and outside of the EU that goes hand in hand with conflict, militarization and environmental degradation, yet is politically legitimized by the current leadership of the EU as a guarantee for and key to European energy autonomy. It's, as it's framed as a security priority, um, also, it changes nothing when it comes to the climate crisis and the results of which pose indeed a very real danger to the lives of millions living in Europe and on the rest of the planet. Finally, in the name of security, minorities are targeted, systemic racism is sustained and solidarity is criminalized through legislated surveillance and repression. While far-right violence is skyrocketing and far-right ideology gains ground, the state security institutions in many European countries seem to lack the necessarily political will or determination to address this threat adequately. So given this context or this brief overview that we just outlined, um, some of the, some of the um, aspects that we see as, um, as vital to address 
We would like today hear how left and progressive parties debate security and what our answers can be to the situation that we just outlined. How do we from the left react to ongoing conflicts? How do we answer calls for, you, for European Union that is to take on more responsibility globally and speak the language of power, to quote um, Joseph Borrell, the High Representative of the European Union? And eventually, what is needed from the left and progressive parties to safeguard peace and develop a security concept that addresses the real problems of our everyday lives? These questions um, will be at the core of um, our event tonight and of our discussions tonight. And we are excited to discuss these questions with six interesting speakers who were invited by the um, European Forum organizers to develop their thoughts on the topic. Um, to do so, we will begin with six short inputs, um, six minutes each, each um, from all our speakers. Um, after these inputs, um, Katharina and I will ask two brief questions to the speakers before we will open the floor to the question um, or to your questions. So um, during, the, during the debate, whenever you um, feel there is an interesting question you'd like to pose, um, something that um, comes to your mind, please um, post your questions in the question and answers box and um, we will make sure to address it later and to pick it up. In, in the open discussion um, later in this session. So enough from, from our side. Um, before we now introduce the speakers, and we will introduce them one by one before the interventions, um, one note from our side. Um, as you might have noticed, our agenda balance um, is, is far from ideal for an emancipatory forum, um, which we acknowledge um, and which we actively um, seek to do differently um, in the future as well. Having said that, I'll hand over to Katarina to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Axel. Thank you also for being an ally, uh, like modern men uh, should be. Um, so I'm happy to open the round of interventions. We have asked our speakers, um, also due to the digital format, to prepare short inputs, as Axel said, of six minutes, and we will come back to them with follow-up questions, both from us, both moderators, but also through Marta, our colleague that is thankfully going to moderate the questions directly from the attendees. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Rainer Braun, the co-president of the International Peace Bureau in Germany. Rainer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katharina. Thank you, Axel, for the invitation and welcome and good evening. You know, I will underline three points. First, the urgency of the topic, the threats to security, and then alternatives. First of all, the urgency. I think it is enough to remind us what the nuclear scientists, the noble nuclear scientists were saying when they put the doomsday clock to 100 seconds, um, to 12, ever in history since 1950, the clock was so nearby to 12. And you know, in general, I would underline what Jean Jaurès was saying, that the capitalistic system carries the, the war in it, like the cloud carries the rain. And in a double or three times crisis of capitalistic system, uh, the danger of a big, a great power war is even more important than it was in the past. What are the main threats for world peace? I think the main threat which we have always to mention is NATO. Is NATO the interventional politics of NATO? The confrontation politics of NATO against Russia and more and more also against China. The military budget of NATO is one billion US dollar and it is increasing every year about three to five percent. NATO is a part of about 20 wars in the world and NATO is still enlarging their forces in space and in cyber and in cyber war. So this is one of the biggest, or maybe the biggest danger for world peace, and I've not to underline 
up to now the US is the hegemony country in NATO. But NATO as in the name North Atlantic Treaty Organization is not any longer a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's a worldwide military alliance which includes military alliances with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia, with New Zealand, with Singapore and other above all Asian countries. And Asia is the second part where I want to underline the threats. And this has a new name which we learned, I think, the last weeks. This is Quad. Quad is a so-called Asian NATO, a new military alliance between US, India, Japan and Australia. And when I mention these countries, I have not to inform you or tell you about whom this alliance is organized. So this is the threat we are facing. What is the alternative? I think the general alternative we have to say is the policy of common security. Developed in the 17th, early the 16th by Willy Brandt, Olaf Palme and Bruno Kreisky and many others. It means cooperation, dialogue, international relations of trust should be the background of foreign policy. These politics should be inclusive, including all countries which are needing to solve a problem, not exclusive. OSCE is a example for inclusive. NATO is an example for exclusive. This policy means the security of one country is only safe then the security of the opponent is also safe. Or, or in other words, words with the words of Willy Brandt in his famous Nobel laureate speech in 71, always look not only to your own security interest, but also accept the security interests of the others. This is, I think, the background of the common security policy, which was in the 70s and 18th a regional concept for me, it is today a worldwide concept with regional implementations and regional consequences. For example, for the two Koreans, where the president of South Korea tried to develop a policy of common security for the Korean Pennsylvania. And this can be discussed for all different areas in the world. This concept includes back to the United Nations, and to the international law. And I want to underline that the UN Charter and international law exclude wars and have wars only or intervention only on very specific regulated possibilities. And this policy includes for me also and very urgent the consequences of Gutierrez's famous speech for ceasefire. We need, above all in this pandemic, a worldwide ceasefire, ceasefire to start with conflict solutions, conflict prevention, and conflict solution of all the different conflicts and wars in the world. When I'm saying this as the main background, it has also one absolutely important aspect which I want to underline at the end of my speech. That is the so-called militarization of the tone. The materialization of the tone means disarmament. The concept of common security needs a worldwide disarmament process. I think it is absolutely not acceptable that we are spending in the world two billion for military spending, quite the half of it by the NATO countries. It is absolutely unacceptable when you are looking for climate change needed, fight for climate justice social purposes in the world, the situation in the so-called South, the injustice and the environmental disasters all over the world. We need this money for solving the global problems in the world. This is one main aspect. But also the second aspect is corporation relations are never possible on the top of rockets, because then you never have the atmosphere of climate, of trust and dialogue where you can try to solve the global problems. So it is a political issue and it's a demilitarization issue. So for me, disarmament means financial resources for the fight against poverty, hunger, climate justice, 
for science and education and for bringing the world far away from a great power world. In final words, these all include social movements, above all the peace movement. It will never happen without huge activities on the streets. And I think one of the main points for left parties all over the world is to be a part of the movements and to also be active for disarmament and global peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rainer. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll come back to your to um, to the point you mentioned at the very end. Uh, we'll pick it up later on. Uh, so thank you for for mentioning it already, and thank you for your intervention. I will now hand over to Mina Tolu. Um, Mina, you're the spokesperson uh, for the um, Federation of Young European Greens, and as far as I know, you actually recently published. A, or your own concept um, for alternative security um, with a couple of considerations that we are quite keen to hear more about. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, as the Federation of Young European Greens at our General Assembly in summer, in August, we, uh, our members adopted our alternative security resolution. The majority of what I will talk about today is this young green approach to security and as both Katerina and Axel were um, reflecting on in the beginning, it is also in reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and, what, and how that has clearly shown uh, the lack of crisis preparedness of, our, uh, of, of, of various states and countries, but also as, as a reaction to the increasing militarization of the EU and, and more. But let me go into this a bit more. So um, we kind of like look at three different areas that, that I will focus on today. So one is this feminist foreign policy framework. And as an LGBTI activist myself, this is also includes this queer perspective to security policy and global security. And then second is the, the militarization of the EU which also obviously includes migration. And then the third is, once again, this crisis preparedness. But let me start from the feminist. Um, so to us, this militarization and patriarchy are extremely linked. And so when you see conflicts arise um, in societies that are so rooted in patriarchy, but then the response to conflict is not one that considers gender and is not one that considers gender equality, but also that goes beyond, let's say, gender binary, that considers LGBTQI voices, that considers um, various modes of families, of, of, of communities, then, then that security response is going to fail many people. And that's something that we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, in which a lot of parties on the left have been talking about, is uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is worse for um, minoritized people and for marginalized people and groups and communities. And we're seeing that in Europe, um, how the impact of the pandemic is, is, is there, it's, it's much worse for uh, LGBTI people than for non-LGBTI people. Uh, there is an increase of domestic violence, for instance, uh, towards women. There is, um, of course, uh, people from, lower socioeconomic backgrounds would also face more, more difficulties and problems. And, and so the same way we're seeing this kind of exacerbation of um, structural issues and structural violence in society through uh, the pandemic, then similarly, you can expect that these structural violence uh, towards, these co towards many co communities, and uh, Axel also earlier mentioned, of course, also like increased um, racism through police and, and, and increased militarization on, on our streets also during the pandemic. So then, of course, in, in other conflict situations beyond the pandemic, within um, military conflict, uh, the, these groups are also going to have an exacerbated kind of, their, their experience is going to be different. And often, uh, the, the security response does not consider this. So uh, an intersectional approach 
which is based on intersectional feminist principles, uh, is essential for, for European security policy. And so we think that this is currently an afterthought and, and thinking within this feminist framework and thinking within a queer framework as well that pushes against borders and ideas of binaries would allow us to also start tackling some of the structural root causes of conflicts and instability and, and, and consider more creative countermeasures. And so this brings me to the second point on militarization. Um, you know, we need to put people over profit and, and, and currently we see just short-term military and militarized in interventions. As Katarina mentioned, the EU funding to arm com companies is, is really like officialized you know, there's this like the European Defense Fund um, and the arms industry just gains and gains strength because the EU arms trade policies are so weak and, and this is unacceptable. Um, and then furthermore, there is uh, the border policy um, that and the, the externalization of border management. I myself am based in Malta, I'm Maltese. We are very close here in the South and the Mediterranean, of course, to a lot of conflicts that are happening. And often, I feel that often these kind of, the, Medi the Mediterranean issues are ignored. That this is so important to consider the dialogue between the Mediterranean countries, what, whether they are EU or not, or whether they are European or not, whether they are mainland Europe or islands. I think these connections um, need to be considered and there are no forums and no spaces that are properly set up and geared to really have a dialogue and a human rights process in the Mediterranean. And so this is causing further and further stress. Um, and then, yes, and so we've, we're seeing EU policies that institu institutionalize racism and, 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 and it's time really for a migration policy, but not only, again, when we talk about the Mediterranean, <laughs> Axel rightly mentioned, of course, the, gas pipelines and, 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 you know, this kind of creating instability in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think all of this needs to be considered um, as a whole, holistically. It is important for all of this to come together. Uh, and, and a European security policy without an understanding of the Mediterranean would fail because be it from energy to migration, the Mediterranean is, is, is crucial. It is a crucial part. And then finally, I've mentioned this, I've touched upon this, the COVID-19 pandemic has showed that we need to be more prepared for crisis. And in this, we need a human security approach. Uh, the current approach that centers states is not good enough. Um, but as we start to look, I mean, again, I think the moderators have done a great job at contextualizing it, mentioning climate change as well. Um, this is gonna be one of the biggest security issues faced by Europe. And we agree also with Axel, this um, potentially this, the, the way the, the gas pipeline is being approached by Europe is not going to be helping us. It's not going to stabilize things and it might, in fact, exacerbate conflicts because we are ignoring parts of the Med. So that, that's it for me for now. Um, so thank you so much for having FYG uh, be part of this very important conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Mina. Thank you for bringing uh, your insights within the table. And thank you also for presenting the intersectional uh, and feminist approach of the issue. I would like indeed now to take a trip in the Mediterranean and I would ask uh, Yorgos Katrugalos, um, MP of Syriza, but also former uh, foreign uh, minister for foreign affairs, excuse me, Yorgos, to take the floor and develop his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. And I would like, first of all, to thank uh, the organizers for uh, uh, organizing this important event. I must say that I fully agree with the preliminary remarks of Katerina and Axel that uh, for us in the left, security is not uh, interpreted as a, a military, uh, let's say, concept. It is not uh, uh, conceived only, not even primordially, in military terms. It encompasses also 
social needs. And uh, it is not uh, a concept, uh, this one, limited to the radical left. I remind you that Roosevelt, in the midst of uh, Second World War, in 1941, uh, has uh, spoken uh, of uh, social security as liberation from fear, and included to that the fear of want and also the fear of fear. However, security has also a dimension related to foreign policy and defense. I think the main questions we have to answer is first, do we want the European Union to have a unified and autonomous voice in the international scene? And second, if uh, we answer in a, a positive way to the first one, what would be the progressive characteristics of uh, such policy? You know that there is a famous joke of uh, the former president of the Commission, President Juncker, that the European Union is a global payer in the sense that it contributes to uh, donations of developmental aid, but it is not a global player. Uh, although I uh, fully understand that the military uh, and uh, arms companies would like to have uh, a, a say in further militarization of, uh, of Europe, and I am strongly against that. I find, uh, however, that we need uh, an autonomous and strong European uh, foreign policy, autonomous, autonomous from NATO, and uh, the United States' uh, ambitions uh, in uh, uh, not just in our area, globally. So we need a European Union, uh, uh, provided that it democratizes itself and gives new content to its uh, foreign policy, that would make a difference globally. We need, of course, for that, a democratization of uh, the decision making in the European Union, not uh, beginning by the abolition of the rule of unanimity. This is not uh, uh, possible now, taking into account that foreign policies continue to be nationally centered. But we need uh, a serious substantive reorientation of this policy. We need uh, a foreign policy of the European Union that would be peace seeking in defense of multilateralism, human rights, in service of the reversal of the climate crisis and the promotion of a more fair international economic order against uh, the exploding inequalities that are not present just within our societies, but also globally. Regarding uh, the European security architecture, it is clear that uh, that's our policy would understand Russia as part of it and not uh, uh, as uh, an external uh, uh, threat to that. And uh, I think also that we should uh, again uh, uh, proceed to a more uh, to a revisiting to the concept of uh, public uh, sovereignty and national security. It is not concepts that are related only to the narrative of the right. I remind you that uh, the concept of modern uh, public sovereignty is born with the French uh, uh, Revolution. And in the Battle of Valmy, Goethe, who was present and has uh, been a witness of the defeating of the Prussian military professional army by the militia of the French revolutionaries, has recognized that a new era in the world history had, uh, that, had that began. So, although that uh, we should avoid the militarization of uh, Europe, we should uh, seek also policies that provide protection from threats, from threat powers. The recent uh, uh, escalation of uh, illegal activities from Turkey is just one example of the necessity to see this challenge not under the light of class of civilizations, of class of Western values uh, against Islam, as uh, the European right would like to portray it, but as an important security issue. So I think that we should uh, uh, discuss among us in the left what would be a new modern 
concept of uh, public sovereignty related to the European uh, sovereignty without, of course, the neocolonial connotations that this concept of European sovereignty has acquired in the narrative uh, sometimes uh, of France. Uh, I remind you the declarations of Mare Nostrum. Uh, it is important to give a realistic answer to these uh, uh, issues in order to answer also the different perceptions of threat that exists to different uh, countries in Europe, but having always in mind that we should integrate this uh, uh, perception of threat to a progressive, positive policy. Threat seeking has in its core dialogue and the diplomacy, and I think this is feasible. When we have been in the government, for instance, we tried to apply these theoretical principles in practice, and we had results. Prespa agreement is uh, an example of these policies. But I think I have exhausted my time. So I thank you again for the invitation and uh, I will contribute to the discussion in any of the issues I have touched upon. Thank you. Thank you, Gorgos, uh, for this overview. And uh, thank you as well for um, giving us already an introduction into the dynamics in the Mediterranean. Um, we will actually stay now uh, in the Mediterranean and oh yeah before so I don't want to forget to uh, to thank our uh, our speakers so far for really sticking to the time that is making uh, our job uh, as moderators um, really easy so thanks a lot for that um, to all of you already um, I will now hand over to um, Neoclis uh, Silikiotis uh, who has been a member of the European Parliament until 2019 and also vice chair of the GUE NGL and if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm a member of the political bureau of the Akel party in Cyprus. So we are keen to hear from you and the floor is yours. So, Axel, to thank all of the members and the friends from the Lefkosia, from the Kipro, from the Guardian of the Anatolian Society. I want to thank you. I would like to say hello to my friends from Cyprus. And also, I think that Axel has clearly explained the framework of our debate. And of course, peace is really what is at stake on our planet today. There are conflicts and tensions on the planet, and we see that the situation these years has been characterized by an increasing instability, which creates an unprecedented crisis uh, with the capital capitalistic system and also implies a lot of dangers for our people. So the crisis of capitalism is translating into increasing aggressiveness, new front lines, new wars, new conflicts, which increases the demand for weapons. It's a new dynamic which makes the arms in the industry very happy. And as it was said, we see more militarization. Uh, that's what Katrina said. And the EU is being more militarized. And it starts with the United States, actually, where you have the biggest expenses. The US imposes, actually, the other member states of NATO to at least use 2% of their GDP for defense. So 2% two of the GDP uh, means that it has a consequence for the people. And the EU works in close cooperation with NATO, and so it has an impact for our member states. And then there is a permanent and structural cooperation, and Cyprus is involved in this type of cooperation. And the right-wing government in Cyprus has signed an agreement with the United States to turn the island into a quick intervention force for the U.S. So that we host this force. And we have the East Med Act, uh, which turns Cyprus into an element of this U.S. strategy in the way they design the strategy in the Middle East. Also, in this uh, race to weapons, we have Russia, China, and other countries. And as Katerina said, we're facing a pandemic, and 
We have not reduced the military expenses, uh, the hostile peripheral wars and conflicts, in spite of the request of the United Nations Secretary General asking to stop conflict. And we've seen some nice examples of solidarity during COVID, of course, but militarization goes on. Military expenses keep skyrocketing. In 2008, all the military expenses went up by 2%. 1.8 percent, uh, 1.8 billion, to be precise. Then we see that the United States keep investing in the military, but now they withdrew from a peace agreement on controlling uh, nuclear weapons. They withdrew from uh, an agreement on nuclear ballistic missiles, which was a cornerstone for the stability of Europe. So, at least, we hope that the new American president will correct that and make sure that the US comes back into those agreements. What about the EU in all this? Well, the EU is becoming more militarized and keeps working in close cooperation with NATO. They've worked on creating a military structure. They're investing in the armament and weapons industries with the major uh, European member states, and they work with authoritarian states. The US. When it comes to the. Well, we know that. 36 billion euros will be invested in the weapons industry. So that's a lot of money. And there are so many contradictions because we see that also in the East Mediterranean, which is one of the most militarized uh, areas of the planet. Look at the East of the Mediterranean on your map, and you'll see that there are many uh, battleships there. Why? Well, that, because they're checking on uh, pipelines uh, for oil, gas, uh, they found new sources of oil, and so there is a lot of tensions there. It could be explosive, it's not a play of word. And in the past, he had the Palestinian problem, the Kurds, but now we need to add Syria, the Islamic State, and so on. And it is clear that uh, in this area, beyond the conflicts between the main players like the US, France, Germany, and Russia, where we also see that the leaders of Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Israel are actually trying to uh, gain strategic importance and weight there. They're pushing to grow, and we see what goes on in Syria, the situation of the Kurds, the violation of the international law, the maritime law in the region. We also see what goes on in Israel. Israel is putting more and more pressure on Palestinians, and Saudi Arabia keeps destroying Yemen. So you see, uh, well, Saudi Arabia and Turkey are the biggest clients of the European Union, actually. Uh, they are the ones who buy most weapons, uh, although this does not respect the United Nations treaties on arms trade and different provisions of the European Union. For the island of Cyprus, there's a specific situation. Cyprus is a member of the European Union, but we have the occupation forces from Turkey who also have a clear violation of those rights and those the law, the international and maritime law. And in spite of all that, the EU is not defending the sovereignty of a member state. The EU is imposing measures which are not up to those violations. So 
what they're doing can't be compared with what was imposed on Russia in the Ukraine crisis. So we see that this the crisis, with the crisis there is more militarization, more competition, more fascism, and all this leads to war. Now, in the European left, we're working for peace. We want peace and life. So we need to gather our strength, the different forces, the peaceful forces opposing war. And I think that each citizen has to be more involved in those movements, especially those who believe in peace and in the sovereignty of the people, especially those those who believe also international the principles. principles. The Cypriot left with our party and other movements, we tried to turn Cyprus into a player that will foster solidarity and peace. We don't want to be a military base for the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neoclis, uh, for your input. I look forward to our discussion. Um, we will stay. Uh, in the Mediterranean, the East Mediterranean region. And I would like to pass the word to Auguste Turki Yilmaz. Um, he's responsible for international policies and the working group of SOL, the left party in Turkey. Uh, Auguste, the floor is yours. Dear friends, dear colleagues, good, good evening. I'm saluting you on behalf of the left party of Turkey and share the sincere and warm greetings of our members with you. This week is the week for elimination of violence against women. So I start my words by expressing our solidarity with all women of the world subject to violence and say that we should all struggle for an equal and righteous world where there will be no violence against women. We were asked by the Foreign Secretariat to make an analysis on the current situation in the East Met. It may look like as if the tension occurred in the region has cooled down, but this is not the real situation because the root causes of tension are valid and cannot be sorted out overnight. Let us have a short look of, of the, at the East Met. It is geographically close to Middle East and Caucasia where 38% of world proven gas reserves and almost half of the world oil reserves are located and there is production in very important volume, volumes. It is located at a strategic location, which is a junction for three continents and it is the main route for international trade with 30% share and 4,000 cargo vessels sailing daily. Moreover, every year, 40,000 Russian vessels are coming from coming to Ismet from Black Sea via Turkish Straits. It is one of the main routes of oil transport. It is estimated that the Nile Delta and Levant basins have gas reserves about 9.8 trillion cubic meters and three and a half billion barrels of oil, which will meet the domestic requirements and will be exported. And as our friend from Cyprus has said, it includes Cyprus, which is at an important geostrategical location because it is close to Suez Channel. Cyprus had been the safe home for British bases at Agratur and Vikelia, which also serve as remote listening stations of the United States. Cyprus is an unsinkable aircraft carrier. In addition to military existence of Turkey and UK, now France is getting close to South Cyprus aiming to get the right to use of air base at Larnaca. Russia already has made agreements to use naval facilities in Limassol and Larnaca and air ba base at Baf. Agratur and Dikelia, UK, USA joint air bases have been er and are imperialism's daggers pointed out to the heart of people of Middle East countries. Apart from tracking Russia, with numerous military, with developed electronic techniques, numerous military operations in Libya, Iraq, and Syria have been staged from these bases. We should never forget that British and French war airplanes, which have taken off from these bases, had bombed Syria. 
Russian, Russia is also waving flag in the region with land and naval bases in Syria, whereas China is following the strategy of operating, controlling and owning force and now have a container terminal in Haifa of Israel, Pirae of Greece, and Genoa, Trieste, and Vado in Italy. All these parameters must also be taken into account when EastMed issues are analyzed. Regarding the ongoing dispute for offshore oil and gas, our comments are as follows. The size of the dispute of, or a solution are not only North or South Cyprus, Turkey, or Greece, all the countries which have shores to Mediterranean, starting from Turkey, which has the longest shore on, on the Met, followed by Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Li Libya, Greece. They have all, all of them have rights in the offshore hydrocarbon reserve in East Met. Normally, these countries should have had set around the table and negotiate and find solutions in terms of exclusive economic zones and continental shelf within the terms of maritime boundary agreements. This was done peacefully in Black Sea in past and exclusive economic zones of all countries surrounding Black Sea was declared without any major problem. In EastMet, instead of trying to reach a multilateral agreement for setting the boundaries of, an, of exclusive economic zones of, of every country, which has shores in EastMet, in the last 20 years, some countries have made one-sided declarations or agreements between two countries and neglected others. This is the crucial reason for disputes as these one-sided decisions are not accepted by other neighbor countries. When there is a dispute, there are outcome, outcomers that will come and intervene, fan the fire and try to become a party of the deal and then claim for rights. Now we see United States, UK, France, Italy, and today with the intervention of German Navy ship, the Turkish uh, trade ship, also China and international organizations like the European Union, NATO, and giant oil gas companies, Exxon, Eni, Total, Shell, Rosneft, who all try to intervene and try to grab a chair around the table. When the context is in the hands of giant gas operators, when the control is in the hands of giant gas oil, and oil companies, who do you think they will benefit from the gas generated in the Zor site of Egypt? The poor people of the country or those companies like any Rosneft, BP, who will be rich from gas in Cyprus? Cyprus or Noble, Shell, Delek or others? The offshore hydrocarbon reserves belong to the people of the countries which have shores to the Met and should be used for the benefits of the people, for the society, and not for increasing profits of gas and oil monopolies. Countries should not take unilateral decisions and actions, hold bi bilateral and multilateral discussions and meetings aiming to cooperate and solve the problems in a peaceful manner. Each country has to respect the sovereign rights of the neighbor countries. Imperialist organizations should not interfere. We don't want NATO. We don't want OECD or similar organizations. Neither we want Russia or China and their war plans. Oil and gas reserves should be utilized by consortiums formed by national public, public owned companies and operated by these companies who will be directed not by the ruling class, but by the employees and the agreements should be fair for all countries. Some of you may, could smile to my our proposal. As a last word, I will remind you the unforgettable statement of the revolutionary leader of my generation, Commander Ernesto Che Guevara, who had said, be realistic, demand the impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Obis. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for your thoughts um, and for the nice ending. Uh, we will actually now stop our tour throughout the Mediterranean. And uh, last but not least, um, we'll hand over to Petru Simonenko, who is the first secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine. Um, as we think it's very important to also highlight the situation in the Ukraine, um, where we're facing not only the, the conflict uh, in Eastern Ukraine, but also a really um, strength of strengths in far right and uh, threats posed uh, by the far right in Ukraine that we also want to 
uh, highlight here and uh, give Pietro the opportunity to share his thoughts on uh, on our discussion today. So Pietro, the floor is yours. Уважаемые товарищи, я вас сердечно приветствую. Всех yeah, рад вас видеть. В компартии Украины с огромным желанием и заинтересованностью принимают участие в данном форуме. Форум рассматривает ключевые вопросы современности, это вопросы мира и безопасности. На мой взгляд, при обсуждении, при том, что я поддерживаю ваши рассуждения, которые были высказаны, они обогатят нашу работу по координации усилий. И на мой взгляд, при обсуждении стратегии безопасности, реальными угрозами глобальной безопасности, концентрированной на, на наш взгляд, является милитаризация, радикализация внутренней и внешней политики буржуазии. Это увеличение разрыва между бедными и богатыми странами. Это гларификация нацизма и фашизма. Это и рост терроризма. Вот эти основные направления, угрожающие сегодня безопасности, они объединяют, как и многие другие вопросы, которые мы должны рассматривать, исходя из региональных особенностей и в целом международной обстановки. При обсуждении направлений обеспечения безопасности. Я считаю, что мы все должны сегодня прежде всего понимать, что предстоит борьба колоссальная в условиях того кризиса, который сегодня охватил весь мир. Так же, как мы должны сегодня быть реалистами в учете тех сил, которые могут объединиться вокруг наших предложений по стратегии безопасности. Как показывает историческая практика, единственными политическими силами, реально ведущими борьбу, еще раз говорю, Борьбу за мир и безопасность на планете выступали и выступают левые партии и общественные движения. Это, естественно, та база, на которой мы могли бы строить нашу концепцию и наши подходы по безопасности. Эта борьба требует, на мой взгляд, и объективного изобличения различных мифов, ужасной пропаганды, которая мешает нам сегодня координировать вокруг наших усилий и многие другие общественные движения течения политические партии, которые готовы реально поддержать борьбу за мир. Среди этих мифов это заявление о пакетах капитализма, что уничтожение империи зла, в кавычках, то есть Советского Союза и мировой системы социалистического дружба, оно не устранило поражаемое капитализмом перестремление межгосударственных межимперистических противоречий, а наоборот, при этом предъявило или не предъявило политические экономические карты мира, что неизвестно But if we determine to the next redistribution of the political and economic map of the world, это братки, в кавычках тоже хочу подчеркнуть, союз ведущих капиталистических государств. Это семерка ЕС, НАТО и транснациональные корпорации, которые сегодня наглядно демонстрируют, что в основе такого союза лежит контроль над миром и цель этого контроля решить свои проблемы за счет других государств. То есть обогащение через неоколонизацию стран крепичной аграрной экономикой через ужесточение эксплуатации человека труда. При этом вводятся, и мы должны левые понимать, что вводятся различные рода законодательные ограничения, направленные на нейтрализацию действий левых сил партии движения. У нас в Украине в основу этой нейтрализации положили закон о декоммунизации, который, кстати говоря, в рамках европейской концепции праве свобод человека, и особенно позиции Венецианской комиссии, не находит должной оценки, потому что это действительно борьба против политических сил, которые ведут борьбу за мир. Такие факторы осложняют нашу борьбу. Я хотел бы здесь привлечь ваше внимание в связи с тем, что годы так называемой независимости Украины дают нам основание утверждать, что интересы транснациональных корпораций, финансово-промышленных групп вошли в лобовое противоречие с интересами национальных государств и граждан. Это я хочу подчеркнуть на примере Украины. Вот пошли новые политические социальные технологии. Капитал пытается найти выход из поразившего систему кризиса, используя цветные революции для установления марионеточных режимов в неколониях, как неоколония сегодня является Украина, что в свою очередь провоцирует локальные войны и вооруженные гражданские конфликты. Это тоже сегодня мы должны учесть, говоря о нашей с вами борьбе. После Египта, Туниса, Сирии, Ирака, Ливии, Грузии и ряда других стран это участь не минулой Украины. Очередная цветная революция на 
Майдане в 2014 году обернулась вооруженным переворотом в 2014 году. Национал-олигархийский режим развязал гражданскую войну на Донбассе, войну в интересах США и НАТО, которую ее организаторы и спонсоры стремятся представить мировому сообществу как войну между Украиной и Россией. Вооруженный конфликт вокруг Нагорного Карабаха угрозой полномасштабной войны между Арменией и Азербайджаном Стягивание в нее страны членов НАТО и речь Турции может привести к прямому э, столкновению НАТО и ОДКБ. Поэтому меры, принятые для урегулирования этого конфликта, Компартии Украины поддерживают сегодня полностью, так же, как и в рамках СКП КПСС. Одновременно я хочу вас попросить тоже учесть это, товарищи, на примере Украины. Вот при крике современной буржуазной демократии, демократии для немногих, то есть богатых, идет жесточайшая внутривидовая борьба господствующих классов за власть и собственность. И в этой борьбе капитал реанимирует и финансирует самые радикальные идеологии. Такая буржуазная демократия расчищает сегодня дорогу к мировому фашизму. Что мы в полной мере ощущаем в Украине, где прикрываясь атрибутами буржуазной демократии, свирепствует буржуазная националистическая диктатура фашистского тока. В этой ситуации остро стоит проблема сохранения исторической правды и недопущения переписывания истории Великой Второй мировой войны, отрицания значения Великой Отечественной войны, победе над Третьим Рейком. Именно на это направлены сегодня усилия реакционной буржуазии во главе США. Именно это нам мешает сегодня концентрировать и принять усилия в борьбе за мир и коллективную безопасность. Мы считаем, что подобная политика направлена на делимитизацию приговора Нюрнбергского трибунала, давшего правовую оценку фашистской, фашистам и националистам и нацистам, как преступление перед человечеством, не имевшим срока давности и оправдывает современных неонацистов. Товарищи, это действительно очень важно, учитывая, что и европейские парламентарии и в составе ПАСЭ должны сегодня очень серьезно относиться к последствиям, принятым какими резолюциями, когда уравнивают ответственность и э, режима Сталина и Гитлера за развязывание Второй мировой войны. Это недопустимая вещь. Более того, у нас в Украине идеология интегрального национализма это объединенная в себе постулаты гитлеровского нацизма и итальянского фашизма то есть националистическая uh, идеология возведена um, в ранг государственной идеологии. Это та платформа um, и плацдарм, который the... создали сегодня именно представители реакционных буржуазных сил на территории Украины. Еще одна проблема, которую мы не имеем права обойти внимание, проблема мирового терроризма. Такого количества террористических актов, как последние годы, не, 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 не знает история. Мы, мои европейские коллеги могут больше об этом рассказать, но главное для нас сделать правильный вывод. А кто же вскормил этот террорист? Ответ очевиден. Международный капитал, который активно создает и финансирует многочисленные террористические организации используют в борьбе за свое господство. Это было сделано и в Украине, уважаемые коллеги и друзья. И именно это при какой-то мере политики двойных стандартов со стороны официоза Европы не привело к тому, что они сегодня вошли во власть и являются составной частью режима олигарха-националистов с методами террористического управления фашистского долга. Нельзя обойти стороной тот вызов, с которым столкнулись человечество в условиях пандемии COVID-19. Я поддерживаю ваше обеспокоенность, которое вы высказали. Я хотел бы на что обратить внимание. Под прикрытием коронавируса Вирусной пандемии нагнетания паники международный капитал вместо реальной борьбы демократичной этой заразы предпринял массированную атаку на демократию и свободы. Это мы тоже у нас сегодня ощущаем в Украине. Еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, это зло, я имею в виду, трагедия, коронавирусная пандемия, она действительно требует концентрации огромных усилий и средств. Карантинные ограничения – это не только экономические локдауны, ведущие к разорению местного среди бизнеса, потери работы, чередой массовых убийств и физических расстройств. Это еще огромные прибыли для владельцев ТНК и финансово-промышленной группы. Мы с вами располагаем цифрами, насколько они обогатились за последнее время. Но по Украине, хочу вот еще раз 
you know, yeah, yeah, to what extent yeah, yeah, many transnational corporations and industry. financial industry, industrial yeah. troops have been really yeah. 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 Many two and a million euros have been earmarked uh, for this uh, for fighting um, coronavirus in Ukraine. However, only 55 million euros have really been received, and the rest were to, um, to purchase expensive cars for officials, uh, road repairs, construction of shopping, uh, shopping centers, etc. So we need to talk about coordinating our efforts. Uh, and at Сегодня концентрируется на главном направлении на создании мощнейшего антифашистского, значит, и антитеррористического фронта. Um, uh, Это одно из направлений. Далее. На мой взгляд, ни одна неофашистская, неонацистская выходка, будь то в ЕС, будь то в Украине, не должна оставаться без внимания депутатов Европарламента, национальных парламентов. Считаю важным инициировать депутатам Евросоюза от левых партий и подготовить соответствующий проект резолюции о недопустимости кларификации на шинмой фашизма. Я понимаю, что у вас есть вопросы, только вы он рассматривали. Но там Европа заняла различную точку зрения. И очень опасны эти тенденции, которые из года в год повторяются при рассмотрении этой резолюции. Далее, я считаю, что успех нашей борьбы за мир и безопасность требует донесения до широких масс объективной информации о причинах тех потрясений, которые переживает сегодня человечество. То есть требует наших усилий в координации с буржуазной дезинформацией и И последнее. Европейская, как и мировая безопасность сегодня под угрозой. Это уже не приложный факт. Поэтому мы должны сделать все, чтобы понизить градус остроты, нанятаемой противниками разрядки, а в идеале добиться подписания соглашения аналогичного Герцогскому соглашению 1975 года, чтобы остановить распространение межрегиональных конфликтов, предотвратить столкновения на основе этнических и территориальных притязаний. Я приношу извинения перед вами, дорогие друзья, я задержал ваше внимание. Но столько проблем на примере Украины именно накопилось, и я мог говорить о частных примерах. И это бы подтверждало. Самое главное, нам, концентрируя и координируя усилия, сегодня определиться в главном. А вот все то, что я сказал, реально подтверждается у нас в Украине, и это опасно для европейского сообщества. Спасибо. Thank you very much, uh, Petr, also for your input and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we have heard now from all six uh, speakers and, you know, these digital environment discussions are not the most communicative uh, format that exists to have a political debate, but we try. And in order to make it also a little bit more um, easy to follow for the digital audience, we thought with Axel that we will now um, try to have a question uh, answer session. So I will be asking, posing a first question, particularly to Yorgos, Neoclis and uh, August, with a little bit more Eastern Mediterranean focus, and then Axel will follow me with posing another question. At, uh, uh, sooner than later, then, we will pick up uh, the questions from the audience. So I ask you again to use the Q&A button here in the Zoom platform and uh, pose your questions for the speakers. Our colleague Marta will then take over this part of the discussion. So uh, again, Yorgos Neoclis and Agus, um, you talked, you all talked about the situation and the, and the dangers, the current dangers uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. All of you also had some proposals on steps that have to be uh, taken in order to avoid the worst, uh, so to say, but also to ensure a fair um, future for all peoples of the Mediterranean. So I would ask you, to take the floor, um, first Yorgos, then Neoclis, then August, to address um, this issue with a little bit more focus on the region and perhaps steps for the audience, people around the European Left Party, but also from other progressive forces that are interested in the issue and they want to get active for peace, how could they uh, support you? Uh, Yorgos, you go first, the floor is yours. You have two minutes or maybe three. Okay. I'll try to be as concise as it is possible. I think this is a good question and a case study on whether and how we can implement 
all these nice principles that we all agree upon is uh, uh, seeking solutions, diplomacy, multilateralism, in the framework of uh, uh, a situation in which, especially the last years, we see an escalation of uh, aggressiveness uh, from uh, uh, the Turkish side. It is not limited, of course, to Eastern Mediterranean. Turkey now has uh, upgraded uh, uh, ambitions even more than uh, becoming a peripheral power. It is building an aircraft carrier, not uh, usual in closed seas like this of, uh, uh, the, Mediterranean, of the Eastern Mediterranean and to the Aegean. It has uh, military bases not only throughout the Mediterranean Sea, but also in uh, Djibouti. Uh, problem is not uh, having ambitions, is not serving them within the uh, framework of international legality. So uh, the obvious answer to that is uh, insisting in the necessity of having peaceful solutions based, however, on international uh, law and the respect of all international norms. Therefore, I think that uh, a way out from uh, this impasse, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, going through, first of all, a reversal of these uh, aggressive uh, uh, policies of uh, the Turkish uh, state and uh, their willingness, its willingness to go back to the table of uh, dialogue. We have, uh, when we have been in government, try to pursue such uh, a policy. Contrary to a uh, widespread but false conception, our energy policy in Eastern Mediterranean, that uh, it has been served uh, through trilateral schemes of cooperation, did not want to exclude Turkey from the equation of energy in Eastern Mediterranean, provided, of course, that it would respect the international norms, norms I referred to, uh, uh, previously. That's why exactly on the next day of uh, the agreement of uh, uh, East Med pipeline, I have visited as a foreign minister of Greece to Italia in order to meet my counterpart uh, Mevlut Cavusoglu and to explain to him that uh, if uh, Turkey wants uh, to participate in these uh, schemes of uh, energy cooperation, there is no other precondition than the one I mentioned before, respective to national legality. This is even more obvious regarding the Cypriot issue, when uh, uh, we have seen recently uh, provocative actions again by the Turkish side regarding the visit of President Erdogan in Varosa, where it is uh, where, where we have a number of United Nations resolutions demanding that uh, uh, Varosia should not be open to any kind of schemes of reoccupation by the Turkish forces of, uh, of occupation. Again, regarding the Cypriot issue, the solution is the full respect of uh, uh, the United Nations uh, resolutions. The treatment of uh, the issue, not as a bilateral issue, but above all as a matter of uh, disrespect of international law, caused by an occupation by a sovereign state, by another sovereign state, and a viable solution would be based on uh, a bicommunal, bizonal uh, federation with uh, uh, the uh, withdrawal of occupying forces, and of course with the evolution of a system of guarantees, which of a neo-colonial inspiration, it is not anymore conforming with international legality. What is important, and I'm concluding with that, uh, although I have not respected, uh, it seems, the three minutes, is that uh, beyond the diplomacy of the states, it's very vital to have also a diplomacy of the peoples. Peoples have nothing to uh, quarrel about. And uh, we see our Turkish uh, uh, comrades as a representatives of a people that has a lot of common characteristics with uh, the Greeks. So we should build Upon, the, upon that, the necessity of having solutions based on uh, international law and also based on the cooperation between 
the progressive forces, first beginning with, but also of a direct communication of the, of the people's involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yorgos. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and thank you for understanding that we have to stop. Um, now, please, the floors would be yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I'm sorry, we have seemed to have a bit of a technical issue. Okay. Now, please, there is a technical issue. Uh, we're going to come back to you. Uh, is the interpreter listening? Yes. There seems to be a bit of an issue with the. Uh, yeah. Okay, Alter, I could ask the students to take the floor until we solve this with Neoglis. Should be okay now. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, it's back on. Okay. The sound was. Uh, okay. It's working now. There was an issue with the sound. Apparently. Okay. So, what I want to say is that there is a country called Cyprus. Cyprus is a democracy. The northern part of Cyprus is occupied by Turkey. And, I mean, this is the starting point, but I wanted to repeat this. Uh, it's important also to say that the left and progressive forces of the uh, occupied uh, part of the country is now actually actively involved in demonstrating in the streets against what the Turkish state is doing. And uh, thousands of progressive uh, left-wing uh, people have uh, taken to the streets to uh, express this disagreement. And I've wanted their voice to be heard uh, and have tried to uh, criticize uh, the attitude of the Turkish government that has imposed a uh, uh, candidate uh, to the population of uh, Northern Turkey. And we know that uh, what is happening now is uh, a sort of uh, fait accompli. Uh, Cypriots, uh, the Turkish occupied area are against of course, that, that situation and uh, were against the visit of Erdogan to what I mentioned earlier. Now, what I want to say about the region is that we are seeing openly aggressive uh, actions and interventions uh, carried out by Turkey against uh, the international law, against the international maritime law as well. Uh, Cyprus uh, democracy has signed agreements, has defined its exclusive area of economic influence, and that has been accepted by everyone, Egypt, Lebanon, Israel, uh, except Turkey. And this was done on the basis of international law. Uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, we think that uh, if uh, we can ever sign, or want to ever sign, to sign a, a, an agreement and some sort of agreement with Turkey, then we'll have to solve uh, some major issues. Uh, the gas exploration uh, is an issue, and that gas that is out there uh, could be maybe part of uh, a solution, a peaceful solution to uh, uh, the conflict that we have. Uh, we had at the time Ahmed Ali Tala, and we had uh, uh, a leader on our side, Christophius, and there was an agreement at the time to agree to share the resources, and particularly gas, natural gas. So it has happened that, yes, there were agreements whereby we would share this available resource. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sorry, Turkey does not recognize uh, those facts. But as uh, Yorgos uh, said, 
I think we need uh, a real uh, solution that will be based on the big community approach uh, in line with the United Nations resolutions and uh, with the Republic of Cyprus, that is a sovereign state with a single uh, identity, uh, as a single entity. Uh, and this I am saying to both uh, Greek and Turkish secrets. We don't need anyone to protect us. We are an independent country. We don't look for protectors. We don't need guarantees. We don't need military forces on our territory. And that is why we want uh, a total uh, demilitarization of Cyprus. We don't want uh, uh, you know, armed forces on our territory. We don't want armed forces around the island. Uh, uh, there's also uh, a British, uh, sorry, a British military you know. so, uh, I think what we need to do is try to establish a bridge between both communities here on the island and uh, we know that uh, uh, you know that British base has been used as a starting point for bombing uh, missions into Syria, for example. So uh, my point is, we need to find a way to use the gas resources and the oil resources potentially there to broker some sort of solution that will benefit all uh, the parties here uh, in uh, uh, this part of the Mediterranean Sea, as long, of course, as Turkey respects international law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Neoclis. Thank you also for trying to keep short. Uh, August, I will give you the floor now. Thank you. Uh, our colleagues from Greece uh, and Cyprus, South Cyprus, they were, are not fully representing the reality. Myself as a person and my party, we are critical to the policies of our government. We are not supporting uh, the foreign policies of our government and uh, the Islamic caste oriented policies in the Middle East. We are against and protesting these policies. But we should not make a, uh, create an image where the Turkey is the devil and all others are angels. There is no such case. Everyone everyone should look at their hands and see how much they are clean or not. No one can claim that their hands are fully clean and the others are uh, bad. Everyone has a responsibility. Uh, okay, my colleague from Cyprus is saying, criticizing the Turkish uh, military assets. What did Akel protest against the United States intervention to UK bases? This is a question. The Communist Party, we would expect be to be against the U UK basis, and the UK basis have been there before the Turkish intervention. So these are sh we should not use double standard. I, I share the word when when you ex when you find gas, and there should be find there should be means to operate it together and to benefit for the people, not for the gas and oil companies or for the mon monopolies. As I said. No, the Turkish people are friendly with the Greece people. The first time I've been in Greece was many years ago, more, more than 40 years ago. It was, I had a wonderful time in Athens. I remember the friendship uh, of the Greek people. I have no uh, conflicts with the people. And similarly, our people, I know the Greek people before the pandemic were coming to the Edirne for shopping on the trail section. These are and the same to, to the islands. But we should not use double standards. Uh, my colleague from Greece, I know he's a professor of international law, and he should not defend me on a policy based on a small island, thousand kilometers away from the main Greece land. We should find solution. When I said Greece in the first speech, I, I accepted Greece's rights in the Mediterranean. I said South, and I do accept that the Cyprus people should make our de decision by own, by their own, and I do criticize. Turkish government's policies in intervening in Cyprus internal politics. Cyprus people should decide on their own, and I will respect their decision, which will conflict with our decision. But my mission, our party's mission, is to defend the rights of the Turkish people, 85 million people living in Turkey, and they have rights in the, the 
oil and gas reserves, hydrocarbon reserves, the Mediterranean, and we should find, try to find peaceful solutions uh, for utilizing them, not by one-sided decisions. Uh, one-sided decisions, we did not start, I did not start the game. It was the South Cyprus who started in 2002 to, to the game with one-sided decisions. So we should not repeat the faults made in the past. We should look for a constructive uh, future, try to understand each other, try to shake hands. And uh, what we want is peace, peace in the, our country, peace in the world, and peace is what we want, and we will fight for the peace. So thank you. Thank you, Guz, also for your intervention. Uh, I understand and I think the old audience also understands that these are not uh, issues that are solved in two hours. And uh, I really thank all three of you for showing uh, the preparedness to enter maybe in a more intensive dialogue. Um, I would pass now to Axel, who will also pose a question to the other three speakers. So everybody served by the time, and we will come back uh, to a third round, including the, the um, questions from the audience in a later point. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kat, and uh, thanks to all the, the speakers so far. Um, we're now going into a, a different field, so to say, and uh, this question goes to Mina, Rainer, and Pedro. So if, or at least that's, that's our consideration um, that, we, that we're thinking about quite a lot in the, in the recent uh, weeks and months, um, if we seek to be successful in addressing the challenges you outlined and also in implementing the steps, you, the steps forward um, you proposed, um, we feel that we actually depend on the mobilization of party members and progressive citizens uh, to support these calls and put pressure on politicians and service. And uh, as Rainer already mentioned, um, also take to the streets. Um, now, the, maybe the, the golden question is, um, what do we need uh, from your perspective uh, to broadly mobilize for peace? And we have seen uh, in the past that this is actually indeed very much possible. Um, but it seems that in many countries, um, we lack uh, mobilization for peace um, and for, for an alternative vision um, of security. Before handing over this question, I just want to um, highlight that of course, we, we discuss this question um, in very different contexts, and it's very different to, to talk about this um, in the Ukrainian context uh, when faced by really serious uh, threats by the far right um, compared to when doing this um, in France, Belgium, Germany, um, or Italy, so to say. Um, the same um, going for Turkey. Um, so I just want to highlight that um, we're very much aware of these different contexts. Um, and they're difficult to compare. Um, but nonetheless, um, Petro, also from your perspective, uh, would be interesting to hear um, what you make out of this question. Um, sticking to the order we had uh, previously, I would um, give first the uh, word to Rainer, then to Mina, and then to Petro. So um, up to you, Rainer. And before we start, sorry, um, two minutes of you each, and also to our participants who are with us, um, Again, please use the question and answer box for any questions you might have that we will address afterwards. Up to you, Rainer. Thank you for the question. And you know, it is absolutely not easy to answer these questions above all from a global perspective, because the situation is so, so different in the different countries. So I try to underline some general sentences. I think the most, one of the most important issues of the last year, the time before the pandemic, was that we have worldwide a new youth movement, a new youth movement for climate justice. Many people were saying about years, what is with the youth? The youth are only looking for consumption. And now the youth was on the street, millions of young people were fighting for climate justice. And I think this is a huge, huge progress that a new young mobilization from young people take part. They take part in many, many countries. We have a big new movement in the United States, Build Back Better and Black Lives Matter, which is very important. And I think a background also 
of the success of Biden, whatever we are telling about Biden. And what I think is needed is that we try to combine the different social movements with the question of peace, because none of these movements will be successful when we are not coming for a policy of cooperation and disarmament. And this is the big challenge also IPB is doing with our campaign against military spending. And what I think is a main, I really will say obligation of left forces all around the world to combine the social actions and the social activities and the social needs with the question of disarmament. I think then we have a chance for greater mobilization. The second point I would like to mention, the second point is that the real consequences of the pandemic, and we will see in the year 2021, when the question rises, who will pay for the crisis? And then again comes the question, are paying the normal people or are paying the rich and the militaristic forces in the country? And that's again, I think, is a new chance, a new challenge for combining the peace question, the disarmament question with the most important social activities and social movements. And then we can bring these together, I think, with, and this is, for my understanding, the responsibility of the left. The left has the responsibility from its own history to combine social questions and peace. You know, I have not to mention Rosa Luxemburg in this group. So, and that is, I think, a need and a challenge for the left forces to do this together with the peace movement. And then I really think, and I'm quite optimistic, that we have a chance for a bigger movement which includes the peace question, because we will never come back to the historical situation of the 18th with the anti-nuclear weapons movement. We have a new situation, we have to face this new situation, and this means for me to bring together social and environmental questions and the peace questions. And please allow me a comment. The one sentence comment, maybe as a question, to my colleagues from Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. You were speaking about gas exploitation. When you are looking to the world and the environment disasters, is it not needed that these gas will be in the earth and not be exploited? Can I ask these questions when we are discussing about environmental future? Thank you very much, Rainer. That was uh, very much on the point. Uh, thanks a lot for this intervention. Uh, I will hand over to Mina. I will try to be quick but effective. Um, I think it's really important that Rainer mentioned uh, the youth climate activists and of course the so many protests that we have been seeing over the past two years in particular, millions and millions of young people, not only in Europe, but across the world, actually mobilizing for climate. And um, the first thing I want to say in, in, in reaction to this, when we see this on climate, but not on other issues, is that if we want to see this mobilization from young people also on peace and security issues, then young people need to be invited to conversations where we discuss peace and security issues. Young people need to be invited also to high level policy discussions on peace and security issues. This weekend, I was at the European Youth Forum General Assembly, and there we also voted on a youth peace and security policy paper for the European Youth Forum to in fact work on um, youth peace and security at the UN level, for example, but from the high level to the grassroots, uh, young people need to be involved. And this, this is not also in panels like these and also having women, more women in panels like these, because also that's another big conversation happening on the global level about women, peace and security and how can women's voices actually be included and heard. And, and of course that, that goes beyond, right? We need to have more voices at the table and then maybe we can start to change the narrative and as fyg we believe the narrative needs to change the way we talk about global security needs to change and we've seen the climate narrative shift to more and more young people through the protest shift but also we see that even in these climate protests they bring an interse intersectional perspective there is an awareness that it's going to be safer to protest even on issues like the climate if you are white and if you are are seemingly straight or if you're 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 kind of normative um, that it's much safer for you to 
to be protesting and to be out on the streets because of systemic racism. So they take these things into consideration when they organize their protests, or they try to at least, and they have these conversations about how can we make our protests safer spaces for black and people of color. And then other things that are done is an awareness of this global south and global north divide, an awareness of the fact that there's this disproportionate right, impact from the global north, from Europe, from the US, in the climate narrative, but not only in the climate uh, crisis, but also in just the global security world. And, and again, suddenly there are more and more conversations happening about colonialism to reflect on colonialism. And, you know, as someone who's, who's half Italian, Italians barely ever talk about the, the colonization of Libya and other countries in, in, in the African continent. And this is harmful. So this awareness of colonialism and some, some people say, oh, we can't harp on about the past, but I think it's so important not to just say like, to acknowledge that it was bad and that reparations need to happen, but to understand that there's such a long-term impact. Colonization has such a long-term impact on people, on communities. And I think um, our, our friend here from Cyprus was saying the same thing. Colonization in Cyprus is having a long-term impact. Colonization in Malta has a long-term impact on our society, on our politics. And, and so we need to also be allowing these conversations to happen broadly and also within the European space, because there are European nations that have been colonized by others and, and those conversations aren't happening. And so uh, let's talk about this stuff. Let's shift the narrative from state security to, to actually having more young people and women at the table. Yes, thanks a lot, Mina, um, for this intervention, also being very much to the point. Uh, that's, uh, that's great, thanks a lot. Um, I'll now hand over Pedro for uh, the reply to the question before we go to the open uh, question and answer session. So, Pedro, and if you can be brief, that would be great. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We have mobilization within our party. Uh, this is because our regime tries to ban communist ideology in Ukraine and uh, are extremely grateful to all our participants, those who have uh, done their best to defend uh, communists and their positions as well as fight with the current system. Uh, we there are 400 criminal cases against the communists in our country and our comrades have been imprisoned for years now. As to mobilization, um, the first uh, issue would be to ensure political dialogue in something that is not taking place right now. All our issues have been Imposed from outside Ukraine have been, have been governed by the Americans and uh, the Americans and the Americans and the Internet resources and, прежде всего, we have been uh, using all resources uh, available to us uh, in our website, to the open dialogue on our site. And we tried to close down our website, so this is like fascist-indeed. Uh, 
Мы пытаемся акциями, пикетами различными, соблюдением дистанции, того, что требует режима по обеспечению защиты здоровья наших граждан в условиях пандемии. Мы все это делаем. Так же, как и сегодня все делаем в борьбе против фашизма. Единственная политическая сила в Украине – это мы, коммунисты, которые ведет борьбу против фашизации украинского общества. Я хотел бы, чтобы вы, как украины европейского уровня политики, знали об этих проблемах. Я думаю, то же самое и Греции прекрасно понимают, что такое черные полковники и со всеми вытекающими последствиями, чем это все заканчивалось для Греции. Так же, как и связано с Португалией, с Испанией. Все это мы изучали у вас опыт вашей борьбы. Мы сегодня его используем для того, чтобы именно наша борьба способствовала мобилизации. Еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, пока эта проблема очень сложно сдвигается с места в связи с тем, что в Украине очень глубокий уровень лимпинизации, обещания. Организация Объединенных Наций признает, что до 60% населения Украины находится у черты бедности. Поэтому, уважаемые коллеги, мы эти проблемы все учитываем. Мы обязательно обращаемся к вашему опыту. Мы изучаем ваш опыт. Очень признательны за открытый этот диалог в ходе нашего форума. И я считаю, что обязательно своих товарищей проинформируем на нашем сайте о характере разговора и о том, что волнует сегодня в отдельных регионах или в различных регионах Европы наших товарищей. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Uh, Petra, also thank you for respecting the time limit. We promised at the beginning of our event today that we're going to take into consideration questions from the Parliament. It has uh, been already indicated in the comments it would be good um, to keep the spirit of peace and not concentrate uh, the discussions and things that drive us further apart, but rather things that bring us together. And I would ask now my colleague Marta, maybe she can turn on her camera because I can see her uh, to take upon some questions from the public. Marta, are you here? Gracias, Katerina. Gracias, Axel. Thank you, Katerina. And thank you, Axel, and thank you very much to the different panelists. I think the different contributions have been extremely interesting and they have generated a lot of debate. I will convey some of the questions that we have from the different participants. And right now we're talking about security, peace, and uh, militarization within this context in the EU that has been exacerbated within the context of the pandemic, uh, we have the issue of Frontex. So the external borders of the EU, it is created as an agency uh, to help and also to address the issue of refugees, but in the end we see uh, that it's more or less a coordinating agency for Fortress Europe that does not welcome, and we see this has been further strengthened by uh, the migration pact of the EU, and they address against the issue of migration and saying, uh, that they're not going to welcome uh, refugees coming from different conflicts as they have been highlighted today. So what can we do regarding the militarization of the external borders of Europe through specific institutions and agencies as uh, Frontex, for example, that are within the EU? And this would be addressed to any panelist that wishes to answer this first question. Thank you. Uh, I cannot see all of you at the same time, so I would ask uh, Mina, maybe, to take the floor, because I can see you Reiner, now. levanta la mano. <laughs> yeah, Reiner. Mina también parecía interesada. Uh, Reiner was <laughs> raising Reiner his first. hand. Reiner. No, no, Nina first, please. <laughs> please. Nina, please start. No, no, it's okay, really. <laughs> uh, 
Rana, go ahead. Okay. You know, thank you so much for the question. I think it's a very, very important question. And I have two elements of answers. First element of answer is we have to fight for closing Frontex. Frontex is a military organization which we absolutely don't need in Europe. It is the opposite of a peaceful Europe. It is militant, it is aggressive, it is killing and destroying lives. Second point is, what is the background that the majority of the refugees are coming to us? One of the main backgrounds is our wars. The wars where we in the European Union and in the NATO countries are responsible for. So we have to f finish and finalize these wars, bring our troops home, look for peaceful conflict solutions, and fight for better living conditions in the different countries where people are coming from. The most of the refugees are coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Who has destroyed these countries? I think the answer is obviously. That is my second point. And my third point is we need much more money for helping the refugees having a life which is responsible under the conditions of the 21st century. This above all means to close, I cannot see refugee camps. These are horrible killing camps. These camps want to give the money from the military budget to people organizing a normal life for these poor people. I think these are three steps we can go and the left will fight for and the peace movement too. I will continue perhaps on that. I will try not to repeat. I think there's a lot of agreement here with what Reinar said and some really, really important points like in our alternative security resolution of the FYEG, we actually, you know, say, you know, Frontex needs to be abolished. Enough with that bullshit. Um, we need to end the externalization of EU borders. Um, what we see, the kind of, again, bilateral agreements between Malta and Libya, Italy and Libya, they don't even try, it's not even like a trilateral agreement, they don't even get all in the same room together to talk about it, but they have like these backroom deals between Libya and Malta or Libya and Italy to really externalize the EU borders and so that it's no longer in the hands of Malta or Italy. Um, and, and I think this is also a massive problem. And again, I mean, I think George mentioned also these kind of bilateral deals or unilateral deals which happen also in the Eastern Mediterranean when you talk about energy policy, but we see that also when we talk about migration policy along the Central Mediterranean route, for example, which is, which is the area I'm most familiar with. But I think uh, I, I, I need to just end with highlighting um, the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has then further impacted this borders and militarization of Europe. What we saw in Malta was awful, was terrible. There was this further securitization of migration uh, to, to the extent that it has really impacted and increased uh, vociferous racism in the country and, and has made, like it's almost normalized anti-migration sentiments. Um, and this because it's coming from a labor government, unfortunately. Um, so supposedly a center left government, but then on migration policy is totally pandering to the right. And, and, and what happened in March, from March till, till June during the COVID-19 pandemic was during the first wave for Malta was that they were hosting migrants on boats outside of Maltese waters, regardless of the weather. And it's not always safe out in the Mediterranean Sea. It's not always a calm sea, even in summer. Uh, it is dangerous. And they're hosting them in boats that are not even meant to be housing people. They are just cruise ships that go around the island in a day. There is no beds. There is no accommodation. They are not cruise ships that go around the Mediterranean or around the world. And those are terrible, but that's not what we're talking about today. But like, so they were housing hundreds and hundreds of people on these boats in, in miserable conditions, um, just outside of the Maltese waters, um, because, because they, they had this excuse, because of COVID, they couldn't let people in, um, regardless of whether there were COVID cases on these boats or not. And the same thing happened for the uh, open centers in Malta. They actually locked people in. Uh, they're meant to be open centers. People lost their jobs. People had no access to food, to un like 
tap water is not safe to drink here to bottle like access to water access to to space also you're in, in living in cramped conditions and then again it's what we were talking about at the beginning like the covid 19 pandemic really exacerbates these issues and so obviously the security approach to migration the security approach to conflict in uh the european security approach to conflict in in in, in the middle east in northern africa and beyond has created uh these like really long-term issues that we need to deal with and the COVID-19 pandemic and the way some governments have dealt with that including for example the Maltese government uh, and starts pandering to racists um, now we're, we've got a bigger problem on our hands and, and I think this is really concerning thank you very much Mina uh, Marta your, the floor is yours Thank you. We have a specific question for Petro. The question is, what would be the conditions to reach peace in Donbass, in Donbass and how the European left can be useful to reach peace in that area, in the Donbass? Я признателен вам за этот вопрос, который волнует очень многих в Украине, и я хочу изложить позицию, которая, на мой взгляд, является единственной для решения этой проблемы. Первое, надо понимать, что гражданская война организована киевским режимом после переворота вооруженного в 2014 году. Это первое. Второе. Этот гражданский конфликт поддерживается специально извне для того, чтобы Украина была плацдармом напряжения в Европе, прежде всего, это плацдар борьбы против России. Это второй тезис. И третье. Для того, чтобы мирно решить эту проблему, Европа должна занять очень четкую позицию и потребовать от Украины выполнение Минских соглашений, которые э, являются документом, утвержденным Советом Безопасности Организации Объединенных Наций. Далее. Для решения этой проблемы надо, чтобы Киев официальный, то есть и в который представляет сегодня режим Зеленского, должен напрямую вести переговоры с гражданами Украины, проживающими на Донбассе. Только диалог между двумя регионами, то есть Киевом и Донбассом, может быть тем, который снимет остроту проблемы. Острота проблемы заключается в том, что многие из вопросов официальной политики Украины прежде всего ущемляют права граждан Украины, проживающих в Донбассе. Вы знаете, что Венгрия выступила против позиции Украины по языку. Так же, как и другие, в данном случае, граждане выступают против этой позиции, в том числе и за рубежом. Далее, проблема, которая связана с тем, что Украина сегодня But через закон о декоммунизации, по сути дела, делегитимизирует государственность Украины. Сейчас в Украине, если только мирным путем между Киевом и Донбассом вести диалог, Европа в ближайшее время столкнется с колоссальной проблемой, потому что закон о декоммунизации признал все акты с 17 года, с 1917 по 1991 год преступными. То есть преступным является то, что в Потсдаме было решено, то, что было решено при определении границ Европы в 1975 года. У нас в Польше будет притязание в Украине, по территории, в Румынии, в Чехии, в Венгрии. Поэтому, уважаемые коллеги, я хотел бы, чтобы вы понимали, без внутри политического диалога в Украине, между Киевом и режимом Зеленского с представителями Донбасса не будет никогда этот вопрос решен. В лучшем случае это длительное Приднестровье, в лучшем случае, а мои прогнозы сбываются, Украина потеряла Донбасс. Это результат политики фашизации, которая была создана. Поэтому я еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, для этого диалога надо реально заниматься, по сути дела, тем, чтобы изменения в Конституции внести, особый статус этого региона признать. У нас было в действующей Конституции до событий 2014 года, ведь Крым у нас был как 
как автономная республика со своей конституцией. Крым имел свою собственную конституцию, и конституция Украины была еще. Поэтому, товарищи, мы коммунисты глубоко разобрались в этих проблемах, и наше предложение наиболее реальное. Я не случайно в 14 году выезжал к вам и в парламенте Франции, Германии, Испании. Я встречался и объяснял, не рассматривайте конфликт на Донбассе, как конфликт между Украиной и Россией. Это гражданский конфликт внутри Украины в результате той политики, которую проводит официальный Киев. Он не самостоятельный в своих решениях. Американцы диктуют ему сегодня ситуацию, как она будет и должна развиваться, в числе вот этот конфликт на Донбассе. Nos preguntan también eh, question. en cuestión y en conexión con lo que hablábamos antes Is de Frontex, también nos we hacen la siguiente cuestión, ¿no? Dicen que se está produciendo cada vez más esa militarización de las fuerzas policiales y el desarrollo de empresas eh, de vigilancia, que además eh, son un companies. mercado de armas, esas propias That empresas. Um, la cuestión the, es... Weapons industry, the arms industry. So, what common answers can be given to have more security from the left movement in Europe? Para cualquiera de los panelistas también. Question is addressed to all the panelists. I would suggest yet uh, that we start with those that haven't spoken yet in the second, in the third round. So maybe August. And uh, Neoclis, yeah, saw your hand, yeah. I said, would you please repeat the question? I missed it. Marta, can you repeat the question, please? Sí. En relación con lo que hablábamos yes. de Frontex, nos dicen que cada vez estamos asistiendo a una mayor militarización de la policía o incluso de contratación de estas empresas de seguridad de las fronteras que al final también se convierten en empresas armamentistas y la cuestión es que alternativas concretas o alternativas concretas se pueden dar desde la izquierda para revertir estas cuestiones y que tengamos una seguridad instrumentalizada pero desde las fuerzas de izquierdas en Europa. Well designed security by the left movement and left forces in Europe. It's a difficult question. The, no company should have the right to intervene to public movements. It's the, if there is the police officers, it's their task. And there is no, no one should be given the authority as a security force and to deal with the security issues. This, no one has the right to delegate such a right. And we will be protesting any policies uh, which will support such an idea. Uh, the police services also should be for the people not for the governments to provide the security of the society, not only for the ruling class. Thank you very much, Okuz. Maybe um, Neoclis or Yorgos want to take up on that question as well. Yes, Neoclis. Katerina. I agree with the question about the question η αριστερά πρέπει να παρέμβει για να αλλάξει η ατζέντα. Δεν μπορεί η λογική να είναι η Ευρώπη φρούριο. Και όχι μόνο γιατί αυτή η λογική στρέφεται ενάντια στις παραδόσεις, στις αξίες της Ευρώπης, για δικαιοσύνη, για αλληλεγγύη. Είναι και αδιέξοδο. Uh, Νεοκλή, συγγνώμη, υπάρχει ένα πρόβλημα με τη μετάφραση. Uh, there seems to be a problem with the translation. Right. Oh, oh, it's okay. So we had a technical issue. Apparently, we can now hear the speaker. Go ahead, please. 
Ναι, ο Κλή, μπορείς να ξαναξεκινήσεις, συγγνώμη. Ναι, ναι, να, να πω από την αρχή ότι so, η λογική για Frontex, για αστυνομικές δυνάμεις, για περιφρούσεις της ασφάλειας, είναι εμείς ως αριστερά, είναι αδιέξω. Frontex wants to αδιέξω. turn Europe into a castle, a strong place, but for us, στις, uh, the left forces, it's not acceptable because it goes against the European values and against the Europe of solidarity. Now, for decades, even for centuries, Europe has been protecting, and then we got stuck somehow. It was said many times at the European Parliament. In the next decade, the population of Africa will double. So, there will be more civil wars, more poor people, more hunger in Africa, and if this happens, there will be millions of refugees coming from Africa, and no front text, and the likes will be able to block these people, so the left forces have to take action to change the underlying rationale of all those polit politicians, so we need to make sure that the EU takes initiatives for peace, because as long as you have war there, you have refugees. And when you have refugees, and if you have refugees, then you need to have them legally and provide secure routes and services to the refugees. Then we need to implement a strategy to develop those regions in the sub-Saharan region. We don't have to take a neo-colonialist approach. We need to implement policies that will have developed those regions. And this is actually the only way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nucleus. I would uh, then proceed and give uh, uh, the word again to Yorgos. We are just three minutes before the official end. We started five minutes later, so uh, yes, try to, try to keep in time. Axel and I will try to wrap up after your goes. First of all, I would like to agree with uh, previous speakers. Want, uh, the priority number one should be to tackle the root causes of uh, migration. That is uh, huge inequalities. The fact that Africa is becoming a black hole of uh, globalization. Uh, and also, I should agree with what Oduz has said, that this requires a public response. It is not uh, to any private uh, company to have a, a, to a substitute the, the, the necessary public response to issues like that. But I would like to complement uh, these uh, uh, first remarks with the following thoughts. Even if we manage to have a more fair international uh, economic order. Even if we help the sub-Saharan African states to have better economic policies, we should continue to have migration flows because they are inherent to the globalization. And we would have also to uh, uh, treat refugee issues according to the European legal culture and political culture, as Neocles has said. This is beyond any kind of national answer. That requires European answers. It requires, first of all, a complete change of the Dublin Treaty, which now puts all the weight of the treatment of migration flows and the refugee demands to the frontier uh, countries of the European Union. That is Italy, uh, Spain, Greece, Malta, and also uh, introduces to the uh, discourse this uh, narrative of uh, castle Europe. We are, of course, against any kind of uh, this uh, interpretation of the conflict, which has also hidden connotations of class, uh, of, of, of culture, or class of religions, a hidden Islamophobia. Some of our uh, uh, listeners have uh, asked questions about that. So we need a clear European policy that would respect international law, the Geneva Treaty, the respect of the humanitarian law and the law for the refugees, 
but also common European policies that uh, would define what Europe has to do with, uh, uh, with this problem of the globalization, not just uh, of uh, the conjunction. And uh, if we have this policy, which of course requires a massive change of the balance of forces in favor of the progressive forces in Europe, then we would have the necessity of an organization implementing this European policy, the necessary collaboration between European and uh, national authorities. That's why I, answer, I answered uh, when we, in the first uh, round of uh, my presentation, why I consider that we need to think about European answers in issues like that, and not just national ones. This is not a nationalistic uh, viewpoint, it's quite the opposite. The necessity to adapt our ideology and our values and principles to the new conditions of globalization. Thank you very much, Yorgos. And these were indeed uh, the last words of our panel tonight. Um, as we are now at uh, eight o'clock in the evening, I want to thank everybody uh, who's still with us for a very engaged and lively debate. Uh, thanks a lot for that. I think we've seen that um, as, a, as a pluralistic forum um, that we're part of, um, we, have, uh, we have different opinions that we, um, that we exchange and this is also the place um, to do so, not necessarily um, to find agreement on every aspect, but also to indicate for us um, on which aspects um, there is a need for further room for discussion. And I think um, we have seen that also tonight and we will pick that up uh, and take that into consideration. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our speakers um, for their commitment, for taking the time, for the preparation, um, for making our life as moderators easy. Um, and yeah, we've uh, seen it uh, in the chat already. Um, a big thank you uh, to the moderators who have been uh, doing a fantastic job tonight. Um, but also to Marta, thank you for sorting out the um the questions who came from our participants um thanks a lot for that and um, yeah there are a couple of questions which are actually not answered yet um so thanks to all participants um for your understanding that we couldn't um take up your question um but i've taken note of them note of the questions that we haven't addressed yet um that's a certainly very interesting um and we'll actually have an opportunity to further discuss security and um, what security means for the left in Europe um, at a workshop during the European Forum um, this Wednesday at the same time. So if you check the program of the European Forum, you'll see the workshop on uh, Wednesday at six o'clock uh, CET. Before I forget anything, and of course, I want to give uh, Katharina also the opportunity um, for closing words. I uh, hand over to Katharina. Well, thank you very much, Axel. As you said, um, the time is passing quite fast, uh, mostly when you have interesting discussion. I want to thank on my side everyone for, the, um, for their openness to take part in this discussion and uh, just to remind ourselves that the, the first thing we need is an agreement to be able to disagree in a civil and productive matter in order to be able to stand together and really confront the challenges that are lying ahead. Uh, peace needs to be defended. Same goes uh, for social, uh, democratic and human rights. So thank you all again for taking the time today. There will be a report of this session uh, by my Mola in the end final session of the European Forum on the 28th. And again, maybe we see some of you uh, uh, on the 25th. Thanks to the interpreters for all the hard work. And thank you everybody for staying with us so long. Bye bye, everybody. Have, Have a nice, nice evening. Ciao. Stay in touch. Bye bye.